On 1st of September 1939, 80 years ago today, the German invasion of Poland began. This invasion marks the beginning of World War II in Europe and brings about the involvement of Germany, Poland, the United Kingdom, France, Slovakia and the Soviet Union. Germany had annexed Austria and then Czechoslovakia between March of 1938 and March of 1939. Subsequently, they had begun eyeing up the region known as the Danzig Corridor in Poland. Unwilling to suffer the same fate as Czechoslovakia, which rolled over without a fight, Poland refused to make any major concessions to the Germans and instead sought the help of the Western Allies. The UK and France had previously engaged in a policy known as appeasement towards the Germans up until the end of 1938, but had now at last turned openly hostile against Germany. On 31st of March 1939, the UK guaranteed Polish independence, and on 25th of August, just a few days before the war's outbreak, the two countries signed a military alliance. Poland, meanwhile, had for a long time attempted to walk the rope between the Germans and its other powerful neighbor, the Soviet Union, hoping that both countries would view Poland as a vital buffer against the other. However, both countries had a motive to conspire for Poland's destruction. The USSR had lost territory and population to Poland in the Polish-Soviet War between 1919 and 1921, whereas Germany, culturally and ideologically, was unwilling to accept the Polish state's existence, certainly in its current borders on formerly German territory. Poland was viewed as a vital stepping stone towards the National Socialists' ultimate goal of acquiring Lebensraum, living space for the German people. The German leadership did not believe that the Allies would actually step up to fulfill their guarantee. Instead, they attempted to neutralize the only country that they thought might actually threaten their ambitions in Poland, the Soviet Union. Both the Allies and the Germans attempted to win Soviet favor over the course of the year 1939. But after Joseph Stalin purged the foreign ministry, Germany and the Soviet Union entered negotiations to carve up Eastern Europe, officially disguised as a mere non-aggression pact. This agreement, known as the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, was finalized on 23rd of August. Germany eventually invaded Poland on 1st of September 1939. So much for a very brief diplomatic rundown of the situation. There are several diplomacy-focused histories of the 1930s and World War II that go into much more detail, but that is outside of our focus for today. Let us move on to geography. When covering a military campaign, it is important to first consider the geography, because the geography ultimately shapes the considerations made by the military leaderships. We will quickly see that the Polish defenders in this war never stood a chance to win it, this is mainly a result of the German numerical superiority, but was to some extent also determined by geography. Poland was surrounded by German-controlled territories on four sides. Pomerania to the northwest, Silesia to the southwest, East Prussia to the northeast, and the German puppet state of Slovakia to the south. That does not even take into account the fact that the invasion of Poland was coordinated with the Soviet Union, which you could count as a fifth side that Poland was surrounded on. The Polish military leadership never made a full plan for a two-sided defense against both Germany and the USSR, as that was deemed impossible. Instead, they hoped that the ideological rivalry between the two regimes would mean that if one of them was to attack Poland, the other would look favorably upon them and maybe even aid them. Since 1938, when the Germans became more proactive in their expansions than the Soviets were, the Polish defensive focus shifted to the west in hopes to repel a German invasion. The eastern border was left at most lightly defended. Polish geography is mostly flat, and the only exception of that are the Carpathian Mountains in the south and the marshy swamps of the Pripyat in the east. With the geography out of the way, let's cover the critical military theory. The German operational plan, known as Case White, consisted of the simultaneous attack of two army groups to invade all of Poland. This is important, as it had been considered for quite some time to maybe just seize Danzig and the other regions that were considered German, instead of engaging in a full campaign. However, Poland had begun a partial mobilization in March of 1939, and as such, 
the decision was made to instead invade all of Poland at once. The two army groups were to be Army Group North and South. A weaker supporting force of 600,000 was to attack in the north. Third Army in East Prussia was to apply early pressure southwards and to push towards the Narev, Bug and Vistula rivers. This was done to cover 4th Army in Pomerania, which was to take the Danzig Corridor. From there, 4th Army would transfer some of its forces to link up with 3rd Army in northeastern Poland and use other forces to push towards Warsaw and to help an encirclement west of the Vistula. The main force was to be Army Group South, with its almost 900,000 troops, consisting of the 8th Army on the left, the 10th Army in the center and the 14th Army on the right. 10th Army was to carry the main German thrust over the Warta River towards Lodz and Warsaw. It was to be supported by 8th Army on the left, pushing the Polish defenders across the Warta, as well as linking up to 4th Army in the north. On the German right, 14th Army was to cooperate with the 1st Slovak Army, to push northeast over Krakow along the Vistula towards the Sun. 14th Army in the south and 3rd Army in the north would eventually be positioned in the Polish rear and act as the anvil, whereas 4th, 8th and 10th Armies were to be the hammer. The overall plan was to drive all Polish forces into a cauldron west of the Vistula and Narev to smash them. The Germans had to make great haste, as they knowingly overcommitted to the Poland campaign leaving the western border against France mostly undefended. France would be able to field 80 to 100 divisions after a full mobilization and was faced with a German border guard, defended only by fewer than 20. As for the German tactical considerations, the invasion of Poland would first showcase what in popular history is often called the Blitzkrieg, although this term was not used by the German commanders who oversaw the operations, but is rather a joint product of British and German propaganda. The Germans would have referred to their strategy as Bewegungskrieg, the War of Movement, which consisted of a tight operation between infantry, mobile troops and air force to enable quick advances into enemy territory, facilitate the destruction of logistical strong points like airfields, railroads, supply depots and fortifications, to ultimately encircle enemy formations, besiege them in a so-called Kesselschlacht, cauldron battle, and then drain their supplies until they are forced to surrender. Now let's talk about the Polish defenders and their strategy. The Polish idea had to deal with the fact that encirclement was inevitable and that thus the Polish army had to be drawn in a ring around the country. There were to be two of those rings, the outer one on active duty and the inner one as reserve. The outer echelon consisted, counterclockwise, of the Narev group as well as the Modlin, Pomeranian, Poznan, Łódź, Krakow and Carpathian armies, each named after the region or the main city they were designated to defend. In the center stood the Prussian army, together with three reserve groups, Vyshkov, Kutno and South. The Polish leadership recognized their army's disadvantage to the German numbers and material and decided that the best bet for national defense would be an organized retreat and disciplined rearguard action until the Polish armed forces could use the major river lines Vistula, Narev and San as defensive strongpoints. With a coordinated backwards movement, the Polish units would be able to make full use of the Romanian bridgehead strategy. Poland and Romania shared a small border and if Poland were able to block the Germans from advancing into the east of the country, it was hoped that allied supplies could be shipped in by France and the UK through the Polish ally of Romania and its Black Sea seaports. All in all, the Polish idea of using two circles to attempt to counteract and delay the German pincer movement was not an awful one, but some armies were not positioned effectively. Both the Poznan and Pomeranian armies were too far overextended in the northwest. Drawing the retreat lines of the other Polish armies, you will see that these formations, because of their position, were threatened to be cut off almost immediately and were forced to retreat. It might appear weird to you that Poland would even defend the corridor and the western borderlands instead of immediately taking up more favorable defensive positions. One reason to not do so was of course political prestige. It would have appeared weak to not defend a part of the country. On the other hand, Poland also had to be scared that Germany would just march into the areas they officially wanted and then just keep them without fighting the rest of the army. And as I noted in the beginning of the German strategy, that was something that the Germans actually considered doing, so the fear was not unfounded. 
However, this meant that one of the armies, Pomerania, was pretty much given a political assignment rather than a military one, and they were not in a good position compared to the rest of the Polish defensive ring. After discussing both Germany and Poland, we should probably also discuss the Soviet Union and their deployment and overall strategy. The main Soviet diplomatic goal was to recover territories lost after the Polish-Soviet War in 1921, but Stalin was not willing to actually sacrifice a large amount of Soviet troops to attain that goal. As such, the Soviet Union planned to delay their invasion until Poland was visibly defeated in the West, upon which they would sweep in and claim the spoils of the German victory. The interesting thing is that the Soviets had not specifically promised to the Germans that they were going to help them, and that the Soviet intervention would prove to be surprising even to their German ally. Now that we are through all the military theory, let's talk about the actual composition of forces. The German armed forces outnumbered and outgunned their Polish opponents, primarily because of the economic disparity between the two countries. Germany had 30 times the military spending of Poland between 1935 and 1939, and the Germans had a larger peacetime army strength, as well as a much larger mobilization potential. The German attackers on the 1st of September commanded 37 infantry divisions, two Waffen-SS brigades, one cavalry brigade, six panzer divisions, one panzer detachment, four motorized divisions, and one mountain division, as well as four of the light divisions. The Polish defenders are a bit harder to pin down, because of the much more incomplete state of mobilization. However, they can be classified as 23 regular and 14 reserve infantry divisions for a total of 37, as well as 11 cavalry brigades, 2 motorized cavalry brigades and 3 mountain brigades. For the sake of completion, the Soviet Union's intervention force on the 17th of September consisted of 31 rifle divisions, 11 cavalry divisions and 14 tank brigades. <laughs> 